basically three drugs, one for cell wall, one for plasma membrane, and one for ribosomes. So it has, you know, a trio of drugs. And um, one of them is polymyxin B, okay? It's um, produced by a bacillus species, and it's a, it's a uh, antipathic polypeptide that it has, again, a tail that is hydrophobic, which it tries to, you know, hide amongst the lipid bilayer. And because of its structural differences, it tends to destabilize the bilayer and cracks appear and then, you know, cytosolic compounds flow out, the extracellular fluids flow in and the cell is going to eventually ramicidin, which is also a polypeptide, but it works in a way that it inserts itself into the lipid bilayer as a um, duplex, all right? So you have one gramicidin molecule in the outer leaflet and the other one in the inner leaflet, okay? And the two will produce a continuous channel that would allow ions to pass through. A lot of potassium ions are able to pass through this, and so that is going to eventually result in imbalance of ions and it's going to eventually destroy the cell as well okay but so you have these two antibiotics that target the membrane one directly damages the membrane the other generates uh, an opening into the membrane of course this isn't going to be one opening it's going to be happening all over the cells uh, and you know it destroys the selective uh, permeability of the membrane and then you know, uh, of course, results in destruction of the cells. So these types of antibiotics would be doing the same thing to our cells. So often these are very toxic to us and they're generally used as topical agents, which means they're part of creams that you just apply to the surface. And we don't generally take them orally to treat systemic infections. Uh, unless there is no alternative available. So somebody who has a Pseudomonas aeruginosa infection, which is highly, highly antibiotic resistant, you know, pretty much all the antibiotics that we have, it's resistant to that. But, you know, this is one of the drugs that works against it, polymyxin B. So if it has to be given, it would have to be given under those severe conditions where somebody has a pneumonia from, poly from Pseudomonas and polymyxin is the only drug that works against it you give it to them and you know it damages a lot of their kidney okay so it's a nephrotoxic drug um, the, the major toxicity is to the kidney because it's directly involved in concentrating it and excreting it from the body versus other cells that can uh, avoid um, you know interacting with it Okay, then you have other drugs that target, you know, cell walls. And so penicillin, the classical example, it's going to prevent the um, uh, growth of the peptidoglycan um, in various ways. Uh, it can prevent transpeptidation, it can prevent transglycosylation, which involves uh, enzymes. And so it's going to be basically targeting the periplasmic proteins that uh, we called PBP uh, earlier, uh, penicillin binding proteins. When they're bound to penicillin, they can't take part in these reactions, which I'm going to talk to you just uh, in a minute. I'm going to show you an image for that. And the result is that, you know, it's the, the cell is going to um, try to grow its cell wall or try to repair its cell wall if there has been any damage. It can't do that. And then eventually the cell is going to uh, continue to absorb water due to osmosis and you know it would it would it would lice um, now you have to you know bear in mind that of course the transpeptidase and transglycosylase the enzymes are inhibited so why would a cell want to grow its cell wall as well so what we have learned is that the um, cell wall inhibitors, especially penicillins, can also activate the autolysins, which we talked about. We said that before you could grow the cell wall, you have to, um, in a controlled manner, clip this peptidoglycan somewhere, right? This armor somewhere, and then you insert the new subunit. So penicillin also promotes the um, action of those autolysins, as well as inhibiting the action of uh, the transglycosylases and transpeptidases, pep, uh, 
peptases, okay? And so, you know, for uh, transglycosylation, the reaction that we're talking about is this glycosidic linkage where you would have, you know, uh, the NAG residue attached to the next NAM residue. So this is a single monomer, right? And, you know, you're gonna have multiple monomers that uh, connect together and they're gonna connect via this glycosidic linkage. And so the trans and glycosylases are involved at that step uh, in the periplasmic space, and uh, the transpeptidases are involved in linking together the peptides. Okay, so if you remember, we talked about the, the D alanine, D alanine being involved as part of this, uh, you know, peptide bond formation, and that the terminal alanine was lost as a process of that. So transpeptidases are involved in generating a peptide linkage with a neighboring pentapeptide and transglycosylases are involved in linking together the, the sugars of the backbone in a glycosidic bond, okay? So um, penicillins, when you look at them structurally, they have an active component that we refer to as a six amino penicillinic acid, and it has a ring-like structure that we refer to as a beta-lactam ring, okay? So this is their active structure that they're going to have, and of course, you know, they have the thiazolidine ring, and they have this R group, all right, so this gray area is the R group, and notice, you know, the rest of the drugs, which are just, um, you know, um, a variant of that same drug, are different from uh, the original penicillin in just that R group, so this uh, is the active uh, group for this drug, you can't change that, okay, because that is what targets the bacteria, um, the enzymes that we just talked about, about the peptidases and glycosylases, but you can change the R group because it affects the stability in the spectrum of the drug. So stability in the stomach's acid, its ability to enter the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, you know, its ability to fight off bacteria that have become drug resistant, all of that depends on how bulky or how small or of that, that R group is, or just the nature of it. Um, so, the antibiotic um, um, penicillin is produced by the mold starting with the two amino acids, cysteines and valine. And like I said, beta-lactam is the most important structure. And, you know, there are bacteria, especially gram-negative bacteria, that produce an enzyme called beta-lactamase, which digests and destroys this that beta-lactam ring. So once this is destroyed, then the active part of the drug is destroyed and it's no longer going to be effective at destroying the bacterium, okay? So beta-lactams inhibit the action of the penicillins, okay? We call them penicillinases as well, same thing. Um, so oftentimes, there are drugs that will combine a antibiotic such as penicillin with an inhibitor of the penicillinases. So if you've ever taken Augmentin, okay? Augmentin is a combination of penicillin drug, ampicillin, and a inhibitor for penicillinases called clavulanic acid. Okay, clavulanic acid looks very much like the beta-lactam ring. So it acts as an inhibitor for enzymes penicillinases, it binds them and it, it prevents them from functioning so that the antibiotic itself can continue to function. So, you know, now there are drugs then that have been, you know, changed uh, from the naturally occurring drugs, penicillin G and V. These were your original drugs that were isolated from, you know, um, uh, natural producers. And they were narrow spectrum in that they only impacted gram-positive bacteria because their peptidoglycan was immediately available. Uh, and then, you know, they were able to enter the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria, so they weren't really effective at treating gram-negative infections. Yes. Yes, Catherine. And Alana, yes. Okay. All right. So you have um, these narrow spectrum drugs, which then were 
changed in their R group so that they would become broad spectrum and that they wouldn't just um, uh, can, can, weren't effective against gram positive bacteria, but also gram negative bacteria. Okay, so that they were able to transverse the outer membrane and then reach the periplasmic space. That is where the peptidoglycan is. So they were functional in that way. And broad spectrum drugs, um, sometimes their R groups are made also bulkier so that they would make it harder for the penicillinase to find the beta lactam ring so that they could destroy it. Okay, so that was the second thing that changing the R group did. A third thing that changing the R group did is that it made them stable to stomach's acids. Okay, so when we look at the original drugs, uh, you know, uh, penicillin B, I believe, was a drug that had to be given parenterally, which means that it has to be given um, at a at a route other than oral. Okay, so enteric refers to intestine, so parenterally means away from the intestine because it's uh, it was being deactivated by the acid as well as poorly absorbed at the um, um, at the uh, intestinal tract. So it had to be given via an IV, which is not always a very um, easy method, right? I mean, somebody would have to be hospitalized, or at least in a hospital setting, for them to receive an IV uh, drug treatment. Generally, we all receive, you know, oral treatment, uh, or you would have to go see a, a, a doctor before they could inject a drug into your system. So if you were doing it, a drug that had to be taken every eight hours, you would have to visit a doctor every eight hours. So not very, um, um, you know, um, effective form of treatment. So. Um, one of the things that uh, changing the R group does is that it makes it less resistant to um, stomach's acid and better at being absorbed uh, at being absorbed at the um, at the um, intestinal tract. Okay, so that's it, it makes it more stable, increases its spectrum. And one of the problems with penicillins is because it's a chemical compound, and just like any chemical compound, some people can be allergic to it. Okay, so allergy is a completely different mechanism than the resistance. Okay, so perhaps when you take immunology, you'll talk about allergy. I don't have time to talk about it in this course, but um, you know, some people are sensitive to these drugs, and so for the if changing the R group sometimes helps to reduce the the drug sensitivity as well. But even then, there is a certain group of people who would always remain, you know, um, sensitive to these um, penicillins. And so they sh there should be an alternative for these people. Um, penicillins and cephalosporins and any drug that targets peptidoglycan has, has a very high selective toxicity here and a high therapeutic index, okay, because we don't share this target with the, with the microbes. So another class of drugs that is going to target cell wall is the cephalosporins. And cephalosporins have that same beta lactam ring, but they also have a um, dihydrothiazine ring, which together makes the seven amino cephalosporonic acid active uh, component, okay? And so this was your uh, original cephalosporin drug Anytime you've taken a drug that starts with the ceph prefix or kef prefix, you know, that is where it came from, okay, or, or at least this is the group that it belongs to. It's a, uh, it's a broad spectrum drug effective against all types of bacteria, not just gram positive, but also gram negative, okay? So we said that, you know, the um, 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 penicillins were originally just effective against gram positive until they were modified into semi-synthetic drugs and made more broad spectrum. And the advantages are that there are fewer allergic reactions, so that's the advantage over its use, um, its use over penicillin. They are resistant to penicillinases because the active part of the molecule is overall different from the um, penicillin, so it is no longer a target for penicillinases. The issue with these um, antibiotics is that they were poorly absorbed originally. So then 
they have been modified over time as well. Um, and we have now first generation and second generation and third and fourth and fifth generation of drugs that over time have you know, uh, been modified to give you increase in spectrum so that they are effective against more and more and more bacteria. And they are not just effective against any bacteria, but the bacteria that are resistant to penicillins because they have penicillinases, right? So you want a drug that treats a infection that penicillin can't treat. So these drugs have been modified by changing their R groups, okay, to give you, you know, uh, that stability. And the good thing about these um cephalosporins class of drugs is that they don't just have one R group, they can have two R groups, right? So there is much more modification that can be done to protect the drug, to increase its stability, to reduce its um, toxicity, and so on, than, you know, penicillins where you had a single R group to play with, okay? So um, when you go through these various uh, generations of cephalosporins, you overall see an increase in spectrum, you know, an increase... Um, 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 toxicity to the gram-negative bacteria that often have that penicillinases or um, uh, se decreased sensitivity to penicillin. Okay, questions? Okay, then we have another class of drugs that are non-beta lactam inhibitors of cell wall synthesis, okay? And so these are produced by not moles, but rather by bacteria, okay, the filamentous bacteria. And notice their structure is completely different. If you were to look at it three-dimensionally, this drug looks like a little cup, okay? And so these are um, cup-shaped um, antibiotics, at least the vancomycin. And the way vancomycin works is that it um, it basically binds to the last two amino acids of the pentapeptide, and it prevents them from taking part in the transpeptidation reaction, right? So penicillins and cephalosporins work by, you know, targeting the enzyme that would be involved in using the terminal two amino acids to form a peptide. In the case of vancomycin, it's going to basically cover up the last two amino acids. So the peptidases could be functional, but, you know, they can't find these two substrates to, um, you know, carry out the peptide, uh, peptide bond formation reaction. So this drug was initially discovered in response to um, to uh, treating uh, Staphylococcus aureus um, uh, dependent MRSA infections. And Staphylococcus aureus is a highly, highly resistant microbes. And so it was originally used to treat that, but now, and we thought that this was like the drug of last resort to treat Staphylococcus infections, but we're beginning to see high resistance to vancomycin Staphylococcus as, uh, in um by, st by staphylococcus as well. Um, so, um, you know, still it's a different, um, a completely, um, you know, different um, class of drugs that acts completely differently. And then there is a fourth type of drug that also um, targets the cell wall synthesis, cycloserine, here's the structure shown. Its target is the synthesis of the pentapeptide itself, okay? So I'm gonna show you um, the synthesis pathway just so that you can understand what's going on. So um, we start off with taking the various amino acids and especially the two terminal amino acids, the alanines, and we link them together into two D-alanine. So I'm going to just go back and just show you what I'm talking about. So we're talking about synthesis of this, then its attachment to NAM, and then NAM's attachment to NAG. Okay, so that these are the steps. Okay, and so this is synthesized in a step that does not involve ribosomes. Generally, when we think about synthesis of peptides, we involve ribosomes. So here, there's no ribosomes involved. Two alanines are being you know, linked together. And this is the step that is inhibited by cycloserine, okay? And if this doesn't occur, then the rest doesn't occur either. 
Then you have here is the synthesis of the NAM addition of the remaining amino acids of the peptides and then eventual addition of this dialanine peptide. And you would have this NAM pentapeptide that is synthesized, which would then be added to the bactopernol that we talked about, all of these steps we've already talked about, right? So you have the addition to the bactopernol. And then, you know, once you have the bactopernol and the NAM residues, then the NAG is added. So you have the monomer that is completed, that is shown here, as the whole monomer is completed as it's being attached to the bactophenol. And then it, the monomer has to be flipped to the periplasmic side. And we talked about the Muir J protein that is involved as a flippase in helping to flip the bactophenol. And once it's brought to the periplasmic side, then you have the enzymes, uh, you know, transpeptidase that is going to link this to the existing, you know, uh, peptidoglycan chains. So penicillin and cephalosporins affect this step. Also affected the step is when the transpeptidases try to form this bond, a peptide bond between neighboring pentapeptides. So that's also inhibited. So all you know, penicillin binding proteins would be inhibited. So, uh, cephalosporins would do the same thing. Now, vancomycin, it's going to bind to these two terminal alanines, and it's going to prevent them from taking part in this transpeptidation reaction. So although it doesn't have any effect on the enzyme that's involved at that reaction, but it prevents the enzyme from binding the substrate, okay? But beyond that, so say there was none of these antibiotics available. Once the monomer has been linked to the uh, to the uh, existing uh, cell wall, then the bactopernol has to be recycled. It has to be flip, flipped back to the inside. Bacitracin prevents its flipping back to the inside, okay, so that it can't be recycled. Once it has flipped to the outside periplasmic space, this is where it's going to concentrate and you know if it can't be flipped back right in in the form that it needs to right it's it's really um the um, um further growth of the cell wall that's going to be you know prevented and and cell is gonna eventually lice and die because there is always damage that needs to be um repaired questions on this before i move on Okay. All right. So that's one class of drugs that target the cell envelope involving membranes and cell wall. Then you have drugs that target enzymes uh, that are involved in metabolic pathways. So there are drugs that we refer to as sulfa drugs that were derived from a, a dye that is used to dye uh, colored leather that is going to act as a competitive inhibitor of enzymes involved in synthesis of folic acid pathways. Okay, so there are structural analogs. Here you're seeing a sulfa drug called sulfanilamide, and you're comparing its um, structure to a precursor for synthesis of folic acid called PABA, okay, P-amino benzoic acid, PABA. And so for, it's incorporated into the folic acid, and the enzyme that recognizes PABA is the target of this particular drug, okay? So the uh, generally the enzyme recognizes PABA, but once you have high enough concentration of the sulfa drug sulfanilamide, it would compete for that uh, active site with the substrate, okay? The higher the concentration, right? The greater the possibility that the active site would be bound by the sulfa drug. And then depending upon whether it can, uh, it's reversible or not, the enzyme can, you know, um, stop obviously carrying out its intended reaction or just um, be, be unavailable for this reaction. And uh, folic acid, as we're going to see, is extremely important for the metabolism of the cell. So the cell is going to, you know, die pretty rapidly. It's a societal drug because it, it targets this. Um, normal cellular metabolism. And in terms of the spectrum, um, majority of the microbes synthesize their own folic acid um, versus humans, which we acquire our folic acid from greens and you know other uh, nutrients that we consume, right? So um, it's selectively targeted 
affecting bacterial enzymes because our cells lack that enzyme, right? So we can achieve that selective toxicity, although we use folic acid, but we only acquire it in a preformed uh, state versus microbes that have enzymes.